Okay, welcome everyone. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, perfect. Welcome everyone to the course Deep Learning in Scientific Computing. Today's the first lecture. My name is Siddharth Mishra and I'm teaching the course together here with Ben, Ben Mosley. In fact, uh, after two minutes, Ben is going to start teaching this uh, lecture, but I will come back in three weeks, right? Yep. In three weeks. And I start with some very practical information about the course. Uh, the first thing is that this is the third iteration of the course. We have taught it in spring 21 and spring 22. Uh, mm -hmm. But this time there will be quite a bit of difference. Uh, in particular, I'm co-teaching it with Ben. The last couple of times I did myself, that's the first difference. The second difference is that uh, this time we have approximately 190 people who have registered for the course from 16 different study programs, at least. So there's a very, very mixed uh, group of students. And to take everyone along, we have changed the course material to some extent, at least, if not significantly from the last couple of years. So we are going to sort of try to take everyone along. The third important piece of practical information is that uh, there are no oral or written examinations in the course. It's a project-based course and the grade is allocated based on your performance in the project. I think there'll be several sub projects in the main project, but uh, as we go along, you'll get the details. So this will be completely based on your performance in projects. And even if those who don't want to get a grade, PhD students who just want to attend the course, I very strongly advise you to try and do the projects because that will give you some sense of having learned something in the course. Then uh, regarding the lectures themselves, uh, Ben and I, we share the lectures. Uh, he will do approximately seven and I'll do approximately six. Later on, he will show you a slide where the partition of the lectures is made clear, but uh, you'll, you'll figure that out. Lectures will be given in this particular auditorium and they're also recorded. Uh, they will be provided on Zoom. My advice is as far as possible, come to, come to the lectures. Uh, if you can't, you can always follow the recordings or attend them live on Zoom. This is also an option. The other thing is uh, regarding the script. So bulk of the course, almost all, all the lectures will be having slides. So you'll be provided with the slides, possibly also with the annotated slides, right? And we have had a script for the previous iterations of the course, but don't expect that that will reflect what is being taught currently, okay? And we do aim to have the script ready, but more or less at the end of, uh, of the course. So try to follow the course through the lectures and through the slides. Tutorials are on Tuesdays, very important part of the course. Again, later on in the lecture, Ben is going to tell you exactly what we plan to do, or at least approximately. Uh, maybe the exact uh, deadlines will be different. And yeah, that's about it from my side. I let Ben take over now. And I will see you guys on the 17th of March, which is the first time I will give lectures. Okay, Great. so the floor is yours now, Ben. Thanks a lot, Sid. Yeah. Just to check, you can hear me at the back, Sid. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, Sid. Um, and welcome to the Deep Learning and Scientific Computing course. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm really excited to be uh, co-lecturing with Sid. And I really hope that you enjoy this course. And like Sid said, we have changed it quite a lot from last year. So, so this is the first lecture. And uh, the whole point is just to take a very high level overview of the course, uh, deep learning and scientific computing, um, and kind of motivate the rest of the, of the lectures. Okay, so I think we should just get started. Um, just gonna minimize, yeah. Uh, so uh, deep learning and machine learning in general has really taken the world by storm over the last decade. Um, and there's been massive uh, advancements in, in these fields and producing really, really powerful tools uh, that are basically perme permeating our lives today. And what we're seeing now is uh, these tools really having an impact uh, in science too. Uh, so much so that you could even describe it as like a new scientific revolution that it's allowing us to do science that we haven't just been able to do before. So this is an example uh, from uh, Google DeepMind. And this is AlphaFold. And so AlphaFold is an algorithm that uh, predicts the 3D structure of proteins just based on um, the sequence of amino acids, so the basic building blocks of, of proteins. And this is like a super hard task. It's, uh, I mean, it's been an open research problem for over 50 years. And the way that we used to do it 
is just in, in the lab by human experimentation and, and painstaking effort to get the structure of these proteins. But now this algorithm can do it in, in seconds and generate millions of these, of these new proteins. So it had a massive um, impact. And the core technology that it's using is, is deep learning. And this model has been trained on um, millions of examples of these protein structures. And that's why it's able to uh, produce such an accurate prediction. Um, so uh, yeah, machine learning is helping us in this case do science that was really, really difficult to do before. Um, and so I said deep learning and machine learning in general and the field of AI um, has really exploded over the last decade. And, and you can see this in the world today. So for example, every time you go uh, onto Google Translate, it's a machine learning model behind the scenes. Um, Self-driving cars are hopefully going to be on the road soon. And again, this is re really relying on um, machine learning autonomous systems. Um, if you look at the kind of number of publications in AI, it's grown and it's growing rapidly. And also the amount of investment into AI companies and startups is, is really increasing. Um, a couple more examples, you might have seen, seen these, uh, for example, stable diffusion. This is an, a new model which is able to generate these super realistic images based on uh, fairly complicated prompts. So for example, uh, an astronaut riding a horse. And then if you, if you code, you might have heard of uh, GitHub Copilot. And this is a machine learning model, which if you start a function, it can give you a fairly good answer of what the end of that function might be and many other uh, in, uh, useful tips as well. So before we go any further, I should actually say what I mean by deep learning. And I wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, given that we're all from many different areas of science and, and disciplines here. Um, so when we talk about deep learning in this course, what we mean is a, a neural network. Um, so why is it a deep neural network? Well, it's deep because it has more than, more than two layers. Uh, and so there are so many different deep neural networks out there, uh, but there's, the way that I like to think of it is the neural network is just, and it is just a, a, a function and it's a function of an input, say uh, an image, but it could also, could also be a, a vector or it could be a time series or whatever you want. And then it produces an output, which again is uh, either an image or in this case, we're trying to classify an image of a dog. So the output is a, is a probability, is a number, um, whether it's a dog or not. Uh, so it's just a mathematical function, uh, but the really important thing is that function has a bunch of free parameters uh, indicated by theta here. And we tune those parameters to try, uh, based on a training data set, to try and get the network to match the inputs and outputs from that training data set. And you can explain pretty much any deep learning architecture in, in this way. Uh, so this is a really key takeaway. Uh, neural networks are simply flexible functions that fit to data. So for example, with this network, we would train it on say ImageNet, which is, uh, has thousands of examples of like everyday images uh, with labels. We'll get into how we train deep neural networks in the, in the next lectures, uh, but yeah, we need lots of examples and we need some sort of loss function to say uh, if a good if an output is good or not, and then we need a way to to train it. Okay, so another question people often ask is, well, actually, neural networks. Uh, computer scientists were playing around with neural networks and came up with these ideas of uh, kind of brain inspired computing uh, back in the nineteen fifties. So, so why why is it so popular today? And there's kind of three big reasons, um, I would say. So. The first reason is, well, today we have exponentially increasing amounts of, of data in the world uh, um, by, by some estimates. Uh, and, and so this is really important. Um, the more data you have, the better generally the deep learning model becomes. Um, another key enabler is the improvements in computing power over, over the last, uh, over the last uh, decade or more. Uh, so people will say this is kind of uh, Moore's law, perhaps not in the last uh, couple of years for CPU computing, but another key enabler that has come around is uh, GPU computing, so graphical processing units. So these are highly parallel uh, kind of uh, chips that turn out to be really perfect for training deep neural networks. And so this has really accelerated uh, the training and allowed us to train much bigger models. And then the final big thing that's uh, helped us uh, is the development of a really, today there is a big ecosystem of of uh, machine learning libraries. So we're talking TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, you've probably heard of, 
Uh, JAX is another one which we'll probably talk about at the, the end of the course. Um, and these really make it easy to train neural networks in a couple of lines of code. And I think alongside that, not just in software, but um, there's been other improvements in the training algorithms of neural networks uh, that have helped us train deeper neural networks and make them more, um, uh, better, more accurate as well. Okay, so I, I said at the start, um, deep learning and machine learning is revolutionizing science. So what are the big problems that we think deep learning can actually help us with? Um, and, and there are so many grand challenges in science today that are really exciting to work on. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm trying to give you an overview here of some of the kind of big things we struggle with and, and maybe how deep learning can help. So the first one on the top left here is uh, uh, the amount of data that we have in some scientific uh, experiments is, is increasing a lot. Um, so for example, this is a plot of uh, data generated every month by CERN, uh, the particle collider. And you can see that they're generating like thousands of terabytes every month. And so in, in this setting, um, for these types of experiments, we're starting to become limited, not by the data that we can collect, but actually um, the, 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 our ability to extract insights from that data. Um, it would be impossible for a human to go through a thousand terabytes of data and, and find every collision in that data. Uh, so deep learning and machine learning can really help us automate the, these kind of dis these sort of uh, analysis algorithms. On the flip side of that, um, there are some experiments which don't which have very little data and it's very poor. It, it has a lot of noise in it. Um, so for example, on the on the uh, bottom left here uh, is trying to detect exoplanets. And we have maybe 5,000 exoplanets discovered so far. That, that seems like quite a lot. But if you're talking about training uh, neural networks, which typically need um, tens of thousands to millions of examples, it's not actually that many. And then if you actually look at this data, it's incredibly noisy. And, and so what we're trying to do here is um, predict the transit of an exoplanet across a, across a star. And you would hope that the, the flux would dip a little bit. But to just see that with, with the human eye, it's very challenging. And so maybe machine learning can help us detect patterns that we wouldn't actually be able to see as well as, as humans. Um, okay, let's go to the top right. This is a simulation of, a, of the flow over an aircraft, aircraft wing. And this is a uh, computational fluid dynamics is super valuable for uh, many different industries and uh, scientific disciplines. And very important if you really want to understand how, how to safely fly. The problem with this is this, this simulation took uh, 20 million core hours so we're talking weeks on a, on a massive supercomputer uh, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So any way we can kind of speed up this, this with uh, like accelerated computing or machine learning perhaps would be a really big win. And then the final kind of example down the bottom here is, uh, 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 is um, the COVID pandemic. So the point here is the scientific problems that we're studying today are, are getting more and more complex as our kind of understanding increases. Um, so for example, we, we, it would be really valuable to understand how these kind of variants of the, of, uh, the virus change over time and whether we can predict that. And this is a super complex problem. So again, can machine learning help detect patterns in, in this sort of data? Okay, so I thought uh, instead of me telling you what, uh, why deep learning is useful, I thought I would just ask machine learning today. And so I'm sure you've all probably heard of uh, ChatGPT. This is the model that's taken the world by storm uh, by OpenAI. And, and so how does it work? Well, uh, it's just, again, it's just a neural network. It fits function to data, obviously a really complicated one. Um, but uh, it is trained to predict kind of the next word from a sentence or, or something like that um, in an autoregressive way. And just by doing that and being trained on lots of data and being an absolutely massive model, it has billions of parameters. Uh, it can answer really uh, difficult questions. So yeah, ChatGPT, uh, what, what are the benefits of using deep learning in science? Um, well, we can, just as I was describing in the last slide, we can improve the accuracy, we can automate, we can en enhance our understanding and we can make things faster. And it, and it kind of gets it spot on. Um, Okay, so uh, I, I was talking about deep learning helping science. So here's some more examples of, of uh, machine learning really helping us carry out science. Um, and 
the key point here is deep learning is, is a general tool and it can be applied to every different domain in science and has been. And this is why it's so powerful. So for example, we can, we can use machine learning um, to take images or scans of eyes and segment those images and, and see if there's any uh, like issues with your eyes or any diseases. We can use machine learning to take a, an image of a, of a, of a, a gravitationally lens galaxy and we can reverse that lensing and turn it into an image, which is just of the original um, uh, galaxy behind that uh, lensing object. We can use uh, machine learning to uh, classify and detect particle collisions and uh, particle colliders. And we can also use it to predict um, uh, climate models. So this could be super useful for forecasting uh, extreme weather events, for example, um, at, a, at a global scale. And, and the, you can imagine the kind of phys physical system behind this. It's very impressive that it can even have a go at trying to predict the, the solution. Okay, so I've really bigged up uh, machine learning and deep learning. So now I want to bring it down to earth. Uh, and, and I've said uh, it's really powerful, but at the same time, um, having uh, deep learning advance, advance over the last decade has really shown some of its uh, flaws and limitations as well. And it's really important to understand those particularly if we're going to apply deep learning to science. So I'm going to spend some time just talking about some of these flaws. So let's, let's talk about uh, ChatGPT. Um, as I was describing, it needed a lot of data to train on. And uh, you can see here, the, the data set they're using is uh, the common crawl data set. This is basically a crawl over the entire internet. Um, and uh, once they've pulled it all together, it's over 45 terabytes of data. Um, obviously, not the entire internet, but like a bit, like a representative portion of it. Um, and that's a huge amount of data, uh, like 400 billion byte pair, byte pair encoding. Um, the model itself, again, is really, really big. So 175 uh, billion parameters uh, for, chat, for GPT-2. Um, the, the latest versions of chat GPT are going to um, 10 times, 100 times more parameters than this. So just even the challenge of, of, of putting that onto, a, uh, onto the memory of your computer is a really big challenge. Uh, so, so this is one, one difficulty is, is you need a lot of data typically to do to the deep learning. Um, another problem um, is the uh, bias of, of deep neural networks. And so it, it's kind of obvious, really. I mean, you're training the neural network with a training data set to replicate the inputs and outputs of that data set. So if that data set contains bias, and unfortunately, a lot of the models that we train today, the training data does have bias, um, it reflects the bias that we have in today's society, then that's just going to sharpen the model too. And so there, there's been studies done, for example, if you, if you look at uh, facial recognition, um, minority groups, uh, the accuracy of the, of the network performs worse um, because they're not represented properly in the, in the training data. So this, is, this has major kind of moral and ethical uh, issues that we have to really consider. I, I think kind of coupled with that is the um, uninterpretability of deep neural networks. And that's what I'm showing on the bottom right. Um, this is the kind of property of deep neural networks. We kind of think of them as black boxes um, because their inputs are kind of, uh, or they use a very distributed representation across all these different neurons of the, of the network. And it makes it hard to understand what's going on. And so that's important for applications where we need a justification of its output. So for example, if a, if a self-driving car crashes, we would like it to kind of explain itself. And so one way you might think about doing that is alongside the video that it's using to drive, it may output like a text description of what it's doing as well. And then the final uh, example on the bottom left here uh, is the, the neural, neural network architectures themselves. And uh, it's not always obvious exactly what architecture we should use. And I would actually argue a lot of deep learning research over the last five, 10 years has been finding new architectures and figuring out what works. So if you, if you think about image classification, this is like um, a kind of a standard uh, test in machine learning. Um, uh, you can think of how the models have evolved from like very simple, fully connected networks to convolutional networks, to resnets, to transformers. We're still evolving the, the best architecture that's, that's out there. So th this is the biggest challenge, I would say, uh, for science uh, when you're applying deep learning in science. And, and this is the challenge of generalization. And so this is basically the proper property. Yeah. Like, what would be some examples of bias in like, the scientific domain? Mm. That's a good question. Um, 
one way it might play out is uh, uh, so for example, if you're training a, a neural network to um, uh, like generate generate new designs of like a of a wing, an aerodynamic wing, it's only, it's only going to produce like designs that are in its training data. Yeah, so you, you might you might think of it that way. Uh, I think it's kind of related to what this what I'm about to say, which is generalization, and so. If you if you give a neural network an input which is like close to a, its training data, so for example, I've I've taken a, a standard off-the-shelf uh, image classification network for, trained on ImageNet, these everyday images, and I gave it an, an image of a dog, and you see it really nails the, the the prediction. It even gives you the breed of the dog. But as soon as you give a network uh, an input which is outside of its training distribution that hasn't really seen before the prediction really starts to drop and, and it gets confused of this space dog or whatever you would say. Uh, okay, so, so this really affects scientific applications. It's kind of no surprise, really. Um, so for, this is an example of, uh, of work that we did in our lab. Uh, we were trying to predict um, the, the uh, seismic vibrations of, a, of, a, of an earthquake through, a through the Earth. Um, and so we just considered these very simple earth models, which were just these faulted, hor horizontally layered and faulted earth models. Uh, and so the input to the network was just this, the velocity model of the earth, and the output was a prediction of what the, uh, the seismic wave field would be um, at, at a bunch of uh, receivers at the, on the surface of the earth. Uh, so you don't need to understand the details of the problem, but you can see what the input and output of the network were. And we trained it based on uh, these with lots of examples of these horizontally faulted velocity models. And so it's the same story. If, if we test the network with a, a new velocity model, which looks like it's training data, it gets a really good prediction. Um, but then if you, if you train the network, uh, if you test the network with a new velocity model, which is like curved or uh, yeah, it doesn't have just horizontal layers, you see the prediction is much, much, much worse. Okay, so that brings us on to uh, scientific machine learning. So we, we basically have like a major problem, which in, in science, um, when we're thinking about machine learning for science, and, and the problem basically is like, despite, despite having these major breakthroughs in science and machine learning, as I just described, uh, there are these major flaws of, of deep learning. Uh, so the lack of interoperability, the poor generalization, and the fact that you need a lot of training data. So if you step back and think, or actually as a scientist, um, and I want, I want to do like principled scientific research, this doesn't really sit very well. Like I, I kind of actually want to understand the underlying uh, physics or science that's going on in my experiment. And I don't really feel like the neural network's kind of understanding, uh, understanding the actual system itself. You know, and, and the way that we actually do science traditionally is, is very tightly uh, based around uh, this interplay between experiment and theory, where you come up with a theory, you experiment, you validate the theory, and then the theory also should make novel predictions. And I think that's very challenging for a deep neural network to do, just uh, especially if it's poorly, if it doesn't generalize outside of its training data. So the latest field uh, uh, and area of research right now is this field called scientific machine learning. And the whole idea of the field is well, actually, science, we have an advantage. We have loads of uh, scientific, we have decades, centuries of, of scientific knowledge. And we have the opportunity to put that into our machine learning and algorithms and hope that that makes them more powerful, more robust, and more interpretable. And so this is what we really want to focus on in this course is getting beyond just deep learning applications to really putting scientific principles into your machine learning. And this is what I find really exciting in, uh, as a researcher in this field. Um, and this field has been uh, is, bug, is really exploding, and that there are actually quite a lot of techniques out there not, right now that do this sort of thing. And so you, maybe you've heard of some of these techniques. So we, we uh, for example, physics informed neural networks, uh, neural ordinary differential equations, uh, 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 differential simulations, and and we're going to cover quite a few of these different techniques uh, as the course uh, goes through. So for example, physics informed neural networks, uh, they're actually a really great way of solving problems related to differential equations. So you can train a, a, a physics informed neural network to solve for the, the flow field uh, above a coffee cup. Um, and actually this technique uh, doesn't need much data to, to train on compared to other deep learning techniques. Um, another way, which is a really interesting way to incorporate deep learning is to actually put it inside of our traditional algorithms. 
So you can take, for example, a finite difference solver, like a traditional simulation code, and you can insert a, a neural network into the middle of that and try and accelerate or improve the accuracy of the solution. And that's exactly what, uh, uh, for example, a solver in the loop or differentiable physics uh, uh, is able to do. And we'll, we'll talk about these techniques in much more detail uh, in, in future lectures. So yeah, I said the field is really rapidly growing and uh, there are lots of kind of workshops that have happened in top machine learning conferences over the last uh, couple of years um, that are focusing on this kind of combination of, of physics or, or and machine learning or scientific machine learning in general. Uh, if you look at some of the key papers in the field, so for example, physics informed neural networks, which we have uh, maybe two or three lectures on, um, the number of citations has been growing exponentially since, since its publication. And then if you look at uh, uh, some of the big institutions, uh, there's been a lot of funding that's been uh, poured into scientific machine learning. And so, for example, MIT recently uh, announced uh, um, AIFI, which is uh, uh, an institute for uh, AI and fundamental interactions. So the kind of idea is to um, research the intersection of fundamental physics and, and machine learning and how, and how they can help each other. Okay. So that is the very high level kind of motivation of, of uh, the course and why, why we think these techniques are really amazing and interesting to study. And so what do we want you to get out of this course? Well, uh, we have a couple of learning objectives. Uh, the first is to be aware of these kind of advanced applications of deep learning and scientific computing um, across many different areas of science. The next is to actually really understand uh, how these algorithms work and their design and kind of maybe some of the theory and implementation details behind them. Um, also to understand the pros and cons of deep learning and to understand that it's not a, a tool that fixes everything like a silver bullet. Um, and then just in general to understand kind of the, the overlap between the fields and the, and the, the concepts that uh, machine learning can help with science and also some of the scientific concepts that can help machine learning as a, as a field too. Um, so Sid talked, uh, gave a quick overview about the course timeline. Uh, so I've just put it up here, um, uh, the timeline. So I'm just going to talk through it so that we're, we're on the same page. So we, ha we have these lectures. Uh, we, um, uh, and we also have, uh, the, the lectures are on Friday, and we also have uh, these tutorials, which are on Tuesdays. Uh, so we didn't have the tutorial this week uh, because we just had the first lecture today. Uh, but the, the tutorials start next week, and the first one is an introduction to PyTorch. Um, so I, I uh, really recommend making sure you attend those, uh, and it's an invaluable way to kind of complement the, the lectures as well. So what, is the, what do the lectures look like? Uh, so we have the introduction today, then we're going to spend uh, two lectures, uh, just a basic introduction to deep learning um, uh, before talking about any scientific applications. Then we have uh, lots of uh, three more lectures on physics informed neural networks, and uh, we'll describe what they mean later. Um, and we might go on to more extensions of uh, beyond physics informed neural networks as well. Then we'll talk about uh, neural operators for three lectures. Uh, then we'll talk about graph and sequence models, introducing new types of neural architectures into science. Um, and then to round it off, we have a couple of lectures with this, with a, about a general concept called differentiable physics. And, and this kind of ties together all of these different scientific machine learning algorithms together. Um, and then the final lecture will just give you a kind of an overview of where we think the future is going. So also note there are, there are a couple of holidays in the middle, uh, two weeks where we, we don't have um, uh, lectures and one week where we don't have a practical. Yeah, and uh, as Sid mentioned, um, the lecture is going to be in hybrid mode, so we're recording this presentation and it's all it's available online as well as in the in the lecture. But I definitely encourage you to come to the lectures if you can. It's it's good to be in person. Um, all of our material is on the course Moodle page. Uh, you should all have access, and we're going to be uploading the lectures and the recordings after after the, each lecture. Um, and uh, yeah, as Sid mentioned, the performance assessment. Uh, there's no exams. But there's a, a, a semester project that, that you'll work on. And um, I forgot to mention, but a couple of the practicals will be introducing the projects uh, to you then. So you'll learn about them then. Um, yeah, and then Roberto, Emmanuel, Victor are also helping uh, with, those, with those practicals. 
Okay, so I think we should just take a, a five minute break and then we'll get back to it in five minutes. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank 
I need to come down for what he said, but then I didn't find the rumors. That's like nice. <laughs> Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started again. You could just take your seats. Okay, so uh, this is the overview of the rest of the lecture. Um, so I just gave you a kind of introduction to the, or motivation to the course in general. So we're gonna spend the, the rest of the, the time actually understanding in more detail the kind of scientific tasks that uh, we're generally interested in and how machine learning can help. And so in particular, those tasks are simulation, inverse problems uh, and kind of equation discovery. And I'm gonna talk about those in more detail. And then if we get time at the end, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit more in-depth overview of, of this new field called scientific machine learning, which I was alluding to. Um, and maybe some ideas on how you would incorporate scientific principles into your machine learning algorithms. Okay, so, so let's talk about key scientific tasks. And so, I'm aware that everyone here is, uh, there is a, people from many different fields of science and uh, different understandings. And, and so 
And I said before as well that deep learning is a, is a general purpose tool that's been applied to many areas of science. So the whole point of this section, I'm not talking about a particular scientific problem like a fluid dynamic simulation. I want you to try and abstract it away and think of it as like a general problem in science that machine learning can generally solve. And this is a really cool way to think about it because if you create a machine learning algorithm that solves that problem, you've already solved many other problems. Um, and so I'm going to give you specific examples, but try to think in the back of your head how this relates to other problems that you may know of in, in your areas. So the first kind of general task is, is simulation. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is uh, a simulation of uh, seismic waves, again, because this is kind of my area of special, um, speciality in, in some way. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're simulating uh, a, a point source or maybe an earthquake that's uh, starting from within, the, within an earth model when we're seeing how the waves propagate through the earth. Um, so this is, a, this is what we call a simulation. And it's, uh, and it's absolutely crucial for like many areas of science from fluid dynamics to modeling pandemics to uh, uh, modeling particles, for example, or even modeling the universe, like across many different scales. And usually when we're doing simulation, uh, we're not just doing it to see a nice uh, kind of video. We're actually using it as a starting point to really understand the problem that we're, we're trying, to, trying to solve. And, and so we would do the simulation and then say, okay, how do we change our theory to kind of match observational data or, or how do we design something based on a simulation? Like, so there's usually another kind of task that we're trying to do on top. Um, so in that spirit of like abstracting away to like a general uh, task in science, well, we could say at a very, very high level, uh, we have this uh, system where we have uh, a set of inputs. So for example, in that seismic simulation, it was just the, the location of that source uh, and the velocity model that that source was propagating through. And then we have an output, which is the output is the seismic wave field. We want to know what the ground vibration is, for example. And then in the middle of that, we have F, which is like our physical model of the system. And also some way of solving that, that physical model. So for example, F could be a finite different simulation for, for, for this particular problem. So simulation is just the task of finding B given F and A. Okay, so yeah, for, our, for that problem that I just showed you, uh, we have a velocity model and A is just the velocity model and also the location of the source. And then B is the thing we want to output, which is the wave field as a function of time. And then F, well, we know that this system is, uh, is governed by the wave equation. Uh, so we can see we put, we put the velocity model into our wave equation. We have the source location as a delta function as like our source term. And then we have a bunch of bound conditions. And so we need to solve that. And there are many different ways, depending on your problem. Uh, but for, for seismic simulation, sometimes we use finite difference solvers. So yeah, how, how do we solve them? Uh, so uh, the problem is, uh, you know, when we have a wave equation, for example, we do know analytical solutions uh, for, very, for some very simple uh, boundary conditions. But in general, the solution is very complex and there's no analytical function that we know of that, that describes that. So we, we have to resort to numerical methods. Um, and uh, yeah, many approaches exist and they, they usually depend very much on the actual particular scientific problem that you're studying. So we have methods like finite element methods, finite volume methods, finite differences, spectral methods, the main decomposition, the list kind of goes on. Um, uh, and so, for example, finite elements are often used for engineering problems. Uh, if you want to know the strain across a, a, pro a propeller. And what we, one challenge we have to deal with in finite elements is we have to create a mesh that's uh, appropriate for the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, okay, so what's challenging about simulation? Well, I, I mean, I already talked about it in the, at the start of the lecture, uh, is the cost of simulation. So. So this is a simulation of a, uh, of a rocket uh, and uh, the fluid flow of, the, of, a, of its exhaust is expiring. See, it's a very detailed and kind of, it's really cool thing to watch. Uh, but this, like, this is like 10 seconds and it actually took two weeks on 8,000 cores on a supercomputer by NASA. Uh, uh, and and uh, the simulation itself generated 400 terabytes of data. So just to produce one simulation and it's, and it's extremely challenging and really limits 
what we can do with simulation today. We would really, what would be really cool is if we could run simulations like this very rapidly and like thousands of them or millions of them. Imagine what you could do. You could, you could uh, design uh, different parts of the rocket and, and uh, like really optimize that, that uh, engineering system. So computational cost is typically the biggest barrier for most simulation algorithms. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, simulation algorithms usually require a very elaborate um, uh, code, like software development. So as I said before, finite element methods, you need to uh, define a very, uh, 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 a very good mesh to, to make the simulation accurate. And if you look at uh, like open foam, for example, which is one of the most popular computational fluid dynamics libraries, um, it has uh, approximately a million lines of code uh, for that piece of software. Um, so there's a lot of human effort required. So. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go back and think about a different type of scientific task. Again, like an abstract idea of a task. Uh, and these are, these are what I would describe as inverse problems. And so before we were trying to figure out what B was, given our kind of inputs of our system, now we want to do the reverse and we want to say, okay, we've got, we've observed a lot of kind of observable parameters of our system. And we want to find out what those underlying physical parameters of our system were, um, given, given, the uh, given the like wave equation, for example, uh, and the wave field, can we understand what the velocity model is? Uh, and so, yeah, exactly. So given our observations of the vibrations of the seismic waves, can we actually figure out what the structure of the Earth looks like? And that's a really important uh, just scientific understanding if we can understand what, uh, what, the, what the interior of the Earth contains. Uh, and this sort of thing has actually been done on Mars, for example, the InSight mission has a seismometer on the surface of Mars and is trying to do this exact inverse problem of trying to figure out what the, what the, structure, of the, what the structure of Mars is. Um, so yeah, these problems are pervasive again across all domains of science and they're essential for actually very many real world problems. So for example, seismic imaging, but also magnetic resonance imaging, uh, image denoising, estimating infection, infection rates from uh, you know, governmental data, uh, and these types of design problems. So say you wanna design a, a wing that has a, uh, gives you maximum lift, for example. Okay, so how do we solve inverse problems? Um, so usually, or fundamentally, this type of problem is a search problem. So what you're saying is uh, I've got some output and I want to search over the inputs to find the input that matches that output. Uh, and so what you can do is uh, there are many different search algorithms out there. And one, one good way of doing it is to frame the whole thing as an optimization problem. So what does that mean? That says, okay, I'm going to search, I'm going to set it up as this uh, objective function or loss function, you might say, where I'm going to say, I want to minimize A or my estimate of what A is. Uh, because we'll probably never be able to figure out exactly what it is. And I'm going to minimize uh, the simulated version of the outputs against the true observed values of the outputs that, we, that we've observed. And maybe I'll use an L2 loss or whatever type of loss you think is appropriate. And then if, if uh, F, so F here, remember, is our simulation algorithm. So it could be finite difference modeling uh, or whatever other simulation algorithm you have. So if that is differentiable, you can train it uh, using gradient descent, for example. Um, otherwise, you have to kind of resort to other gradient-free methods. And again, there are many out there, like evolutionary algorithms, Bayesian optimization, et cetera. So uh, here's a more detailed kind of schematic of how you might do it with gradient descent. Um, so how does gradient descent work? So you have your loss function. Uh, and you create, you evaluate the gradient of that loss function uh, with respect to A. And so you say, I want to minimize L and I'm going to take the steepest direction in, in, uh, in the space of A to go to a local minima of A in, in terms of the loss function. Uh, so yeah, I just create my gradient of, of the loss function. I uh, times it by a small value so that I don't uh, take too big of a step. And then I just update my A values. And, that, and that's uh, an iterative cycle that just goes through for however many, train, however many steps that you want to run it. So you can, uh, in the schematic here, you start with your uh, starting model, you run forward modeling, and that gives you a synthetic uh, uh, guess of what B is. 
you match that to the real data that you have, and then and then you update your model based on the gradients. So uh, what you should actually take away from this is this: if you if you have any experience training deep neural networks, this is exactly what we do for a deep neural network, and we use exactly gradient descent to train deep neural networks. So uh, there are actually uh, lots of amazing ideas from the field of inverse problems that you can apply to training neural networks and vice versa. Um, so that's just something to take away from uh, uh, for the next lectures. Okay, so how, how would we do this with the, uh, with the wavefield example that I was talking about? So um, we would have some example of the wavefield here. Uh, say that uh, this is what we've observed, observed. And then we would start with a velocity model that uh, we would just say, okay, it's maybe a constant value or like a, a very smoothly varying field. Uh, and we really want to discover what the final, what the actual true velocity model of the Earth is here. And so, yeah, we would just run forward simulation of the velocity model, match it to the data, and then update. So this is what you do. This is what you get if you do exactly that. So again, I'm starting with that very smooth velocity model, running gradient descent to try and match the estimated weight field from the true true wave field uh, that we've observed. Um, and I'm minimizing exactly this loss function, so the L2, L2 loss between the simulation and the real data. So this problem is, actually, is known in geophysics as full waveform in inversion. And it's been studied for decades and has uh, lots of amazing algorithms to do this much better than what I'm showing here. And I mean, there's kind of a, kind of a, a couple of cool things, I mean, specific to this problem that uh, uh, worth, worth noting or interesting about this. The first is that um, we only update the velocity model where the, where the wave field is actually uh, um, um, propagated through. So, you know, outside of where there's no, uh, outside of the direct arrival of the wave, we have no information. So the velocity model just stays as it is. Um, another interesting thing is you can see ar around here, uh, around here actually, uh, the, the estimated velocity is not very good. Uh, and so, that's maybe because there's not enough information in the wave field to, to uniquely determine what the velocity is here. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is kind of alluding to these challenge of, challenges of inverse problems. And, and if you think simulation is hard to carry out, inverse problems are potentially even harder. Um, and the, one of the biggest reasons is because they're usually very ill-posed. So what does this mean? This means that the observational data that we have doesn't contain enough information for us to give us a unique, um, uh, a unique value of the underlying inputs that we want to solve for. So for example, if you take MRI imaging, um, so the whole, uh, actually this is computer CT imaging, so X-ray computer tomography. Um, and what we want to do here is get an image of, uh, of whatever we're sticking under the X-ray machine. Uh, so for example, a slice of a, of a brain here. Um, well, what do we actually measure? Because we, when we when we run the um, when we when we run the the scan, it doesn't actually give you an image. What it actually gives you uh, are these intensity values. So what's happening is you have a source here, uh, uh, an X-ray source that is just going straight through your media, and then you're observing the uh, intensity of that source wherever your detector is. And you can use uh, this is Beer, the Beer, Beer's law here. Uh, to tell you what that uh, attenuation of that of of that um, of that source is, depending on the attenuation through the media. So what we actually want is this a a of x here, but what we observe is uh, this this integral. And so the inverse problem is: tell me what a of x is given given the the, the what we what we call the sinogram uh, measurements in the middle there. So this is really hard. Uh, it all depends. Whether the inverse problem is ill post or not just depends on if you have enough uh, measurements and enough different uh, uh, paths of that ray through your media. So if you just have a couple of paths, it's extremely ill post. Uh, the other issue, so you can see here that the result of like a traditional algorithm is quite a noisy estimate of what the true solution is. The other issue is if, if your data, if your observational data is really noisy or sparse, uh, again, that makes the problem more ill post and harder to solve. Uh, and then the final thing is computational uh, computational effort. So if you remember back to that gradient descent algorithm I was showing, that requires you to run hundreds, thousands of uh, forward simulations to get your gradients. 
So I already said that simulations can take, one simulation can take like millions of CPU hours. It makes it really hard to, practically impossible to run gradient descent. And so we need speed ups to, and, and, and also ways to give inverse algorithms ideas of what the solution could be, priors perhaps uh, to, to help them. Okay, uh, so related to inverse problems, uh, there are many other kind of problem classes you could describe. Uh, so for example, control and data assimilation. So, so what are these? So, so let's, let's take this example of an inverted pendulum and we have the underlying differential equation here. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the key physical variables are like the angle of the pendulum, the position of the car, the force that we're using to try and control uh, the pendulum. And so what we're trying to do is push the cart so that the pendulum stays vertical. And so this is a control problem. Uh, so how do we choose F here, which is yeah. our which is our force um, here, F of T, so that, so that the uh, pendulum stays balanced. So the uh, as T gets large, uh, theta just tends to zero or stays at zero. So you could frame that as kind of an inverse problem uh, where you're trying to figure out what F of T is given my observation or my desired observation of the system, which is that it stays balanced. And then the F is again, a method for solving our equations. Kind of, kind of related to that is data assimilation. And so this is a slightly different task. This is saying, okay, I've got a bunch of uh, observations of, this, of the position of the pendulum here. So where did the pendulum start? And the, the, these observations are noisy. So I'm not exactly sure where it started. And so again, you can frame it as like a kind of an inverse problem where A, a uh, here is what is the starting position of the, of the pendulum. B is some noisy measurements through time. And F again is a method for solving the equations. So you can kind of start to see how all these kind of tasks are related and tied together. Uh, okay, and then the last one is uh, figuring out what F is itself. And, and this is really cool. Uh, so this is kind of like discovering the laws of of, of the universe or the laws of physics or, what, or whatever laws of your particular area of science. So I, I had to show a picture of Einstein uh, because we're at ATH. <laughs> um, we have a, obviously a rich human history of, of discovering fundamental laws of, of the world. Um, and yeah, this is typically relied on like remarkable uh, human intuition. Um, and as I was saying before, like science is based on this kind of interplay between theory and experiment and, and the, uh, combining the two together. Um, so I guess from a, if, so if we were thinking about trying to get a computer to do, to do this and to kind of discover uh, physics, you could still think of it as some sort of inverse problem, which is like, you know, the way that uh, we do it today, we, we get lots of experimental data and then we try and fit a theory to that data. I guess the difference between this and uh, a standard inverse problem is that we actually want to produce a theory rather than just a, like an estimate of a variable. So we want to have like a differential equation as the output or, or whatever the underlying thing is. And, and the key thing, I think, or the, whole, or the hallmark of a good theory is that it should be explainable, generalizable, and novel. And as I was describing at the start, that is very hard for deep learning to do with, uh, today. So. Okay, so how can deep learning... So what I've tried to just tell you there are like some high level abstract tasks that are super important to solve. And if we can just make an incremental improvement on some of that stuff, uh, we'll advance science in many different ways. So the key question is how can deep learning help these sort of tasks? Okay, so let's go back to Ch chat GPT, uh, as I was saying before, uh, well, as it pointed out uh, very accurately, I think, uh, across those uh, three different tasks that I talked about, Deep learning can improve the accuracy. So for example, improve the estimates from inverse problems, it can improve the efficiency, it can speed up simulations. Uh, it can help automate, like discover stuff in data that we just didn't see before. Um, and, and there are some deep learning algorithms that can, can help you discover underlying laws as well. And, and we'll hopefully give you some examples of those in the course. Uh, so I just got three slides here, which is just, uh, an example from each problem. And um, I'm going to make it, it's a very high level description. And, and as I said, in, throughout the course, we'll go into these techniques in way more detail. But let's talk about um, using deep learning for simulation. So this is ForecastNet. Uh, this was re recently uh, announced uh, by um, researchers at NVIDIA. 
And so this is just a, a, a very large neural network model, uh, which is trained on um, uh, a data set called ERA5. And so this data set is basically our best guess of uh, um, 20 or more uh, uh, key atmospheric variables taken from real data. So this is not simulated data, it's like our real, real recordings from weather stations, et cetera. Um, and, and, and it's taken on a global grid. And so you can see that this is the evolution of uh, one of these atmospheric, atmospheric variables uh, over, a couple of, over a couple of days. And so what they did is they took that data and they just trained a neural network given one time step to predict the next time step. Like a very kind of conceptually very simple. Uh, and, and this data set is really large. And so they have lots of training data and the network actually performs pretty well and it, and it can have a lead time up to maybe 12 hours or so uh, where it's starting to predict the formations of like extreme weather events um, and cyclones, for example. So uh, what's the actual model they use? They, well, they use a, a, new, uh, a fairly new model that's come out, it's called Fourier Neural Operators. Again, we have uh, three lectures or so on neural operators and kind of general concepts. Um, so this is just to give you an example of the power of this type of model. Uh, it sounds like quite a scary name, but actually it's just uh, a, a very simple way to think of it. It's just a, a convolutional network, uh, but it does the convolutions, uh, each convolutional layer in the spectral domain. Um, so it, it carries out a Fourier transform of your inputs, then times as those inputs by, by uh, your weight vectors of your network, which is just, uh, the same as if you were doing a convolution in space. In space. Uh, but one of the key things about Fourier neural operators is they clip the, clip the frequencies down to a, a set of low frequencies. Uh, and, and, and this is what kind of differentiates them from a standard convolution network. So we'll talk about why that's interesting and useful later on in the lectures. Uh, but for now, you can just note that they're very, that they can be, can be very powerful predictors. Yeah, so the key thing is, once you've trained this, training is very expensive, but once you've trained it, it's orders of magnitude faster than if I was gonna carry a, a global numerical simulation. So typically neural networks evaluate within seconds uh, if you're just evaluating the outputs given its inputs. Um, so inverse problems, let's talk about how, we, how would we put deep learning into an inverse problem. Um, so one really cool idea is uh, an idea called learned, learned gradient descent. So I showed this gradient descent uh, method before. Actually, you can put a neural network into any part of this algorithm and, and try and improve it with the neural network. So one place that you can put it is uh, right in the middle here, just before we uh, update our model with, with, uh, with the gradient descent direction. And so what the, what we, the idea is um, the neural network takes as input the gradient of your loss function at that particular uh, 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 model location. And then it says, okay, actually, I think uh, given that gradient direction, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a gradient direct direction step, which is like slightly different. It's gonna predict a better step to go into. So if you think of an inverse problem, especially one that's like very ill-posed, your loss, your loss landscape, and uh, it's gonna contain lots of local minima and lots of like humps and bumps that are actually really hard for a gradient descent algorithm to find the, 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 even the global minima of your loss. And so maybe the neural network having been trained on lots of example inverse problems, might be able to say, okay, actually this is a better step direction to take. Uh, and so you might be able to get to the solution faster uh, using like a neural network as a prior in your inverse algorithm. Okay, so, so how do you do it uh, or how do you train it? Um, so you, you just set up your inverse problem with the neural network in the middle of it. Um, and then you train the network end, end to end. Uh, so you, you just get the, the inverse algorithm with a neural network in the middle of it just to run. And you say, uh, you, you, do, you have a new loss function which is saying, I wanna improve uh, the output of the inverse algorithm by updating the weights of the neural network. Uh, and, and then you can start to learn gradient descent. So it's trained kind of end-to-end -end through the inverse algorithm. Uh, yeah, and if you do this uh, for this MRI problem, you can start to get maybe potentially more accurate results for, for inverse problems. So, yeah, it could be super powerful. Okay, so how, how can deep learning, machine learning help uh, discover the laws of physics? And you might think that's too crazy of an, an idea even to do. Uh, and I, for sure, we haven't got there yet for it to really understand physics and to uh, like theory, like produce theories and rationalize about physics. 
uh, but it can start to do some things towards equation discovery. So, so for example, um, imagine you have a bunch of observational data here, and uh, that data is actually produced from a system that's obeyed by the Burgers equation, but let's just say that the neural network doesn't know that, it just sees lots of data points. So u is a function of uh, t. And so what you can do is you can, uh, okay, I'm just gonna treat this as a standard supervised learning problem. And I'm gonna just fit a neural network to, to, fit this, to fit the data. So again, it doesn't know anything about the equations. It just says, okay, this is u as a function of t. I'm just gonna approximate that function with a neural network. And then what you can do, um, so once you fit it, is you can start to compute various gradients of that network, uh, any uh, like random uh, locations, so random time points. Uh, so like the gradient of, uh, of the network with respect to X, uh, twice with respect to X, with respect to T, et cetera. And then you have all these gradients and you can, you can say, okay, my underlying equation, I'm just gonna assume is like some linear combination of all these gradients. Uh, I mean, that is what the Berger's equation is. If you look at it, it's UT uh, uh, times by these com linear combinations of our, of our gradients. And so I'm just gonna take these values and do a, a sparse linear regression over, over those gradients. And, and so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna assume U of T here is some, some set of linear coefficients, which I don't know, uh, times by the gradients of the network. And so we're gonna try and learn these, these coefficients here. And we can do that just by using linear regression. We don't even have to use any, any, anything too fancy. And yeah, there was a paper in Nature Communications came out a couple of years ago, which would essentially doing this. Uh, they, they used more advanced uh, physics and formal networks, but that's kind of by the by. Uh, and they can start to discover the kind of underlying equations to like a, a decent uh, accuracy. So. Okay, so uh, in the last part, I'm gonna talk about uh, scientific machine learning and give you maybe a, a slightly more in-depth overview of, of, this, of this new field, which is, yeah, really exciting. So let's recap. Um, uh, deep learning is having massive improvements um, and advancements in science. Uh, but as I said before, like naively training it uh, leads to these problems of interoperability, poor generalization, et cetera. Uh, and I, I think I've just given you some kind of starting ideas of how you can put machine learning into your algorithm. So if you think about that inverse algorithm where you're putting the neural network into the gradient descent, this is scientific machine learning where you're taking your original algorithm and you're adding machine learning to it based around your prior understanding. So there are actually if, uh, three kind of, I like to think of it as like three abstract ways to put um, scientific principles into a machine learning algorithm. Uh, and the three ways that I think of uh, is firstly for your loss function, uh, training the neural network. Secondly, through the architecture itself of the network. And then finally, uh, uh, what I would call hybrid approaches. And this is like similar to that inverse algorithm I was talking about where you take a traditional algorithm and you put machine learning very tightly into the middle of it somewhere where it makes sense. Um, and so we're gonna cover some of these techniques later. Uh, so for example, physics informed neural networks the, the physics or the scientific principles are uh, entirely put through the loss function of the network. So we add, we're basically adding our differential equations as a term into our loss function. Um, the architecture, we would actually encode kind of physical principles. So for example, symmetries are like super fundamental in physics, like translational uh, invariance, rotational invariance, uh, other things like energy conservation. Um, we, can, we can put that in, into the architecture and make sure that's like, a hard constraint so that the network always obeys uh, that principle that we know of. And typically these types of networks, again, they, they're more powerful, they generalize much better. Um, and then the final one is, yeah, putting it into our, into our existing algorithms. And so if you've heard of neural differential equations, this is that idea. It's like solving differential equations, but also using neural networks at the same time. And actually you can cut, there is, there is kind of like a theory that kind of equates the two, that a neural network at, at like a infinite number of layers limit that is actually a differential equation and that this is a really cool area of research like how can science also help fundamental machine learning um, so um a while ago i actually tried to uh, plot this kind of landscape um, uh, so this is by no means exhaustive but i tried to take some of the like key papers of the field and put it into a table 
Uh, and I, the table uh, along the top has uh, the different types of tasks that I talked about. So this forward simulation, inversion, equation discovery. And then uh, across the uh, rows, there are all these different ways you can put scientific principles into that algorithm. It's like through the architecture, through the loss function, uh, or a more hybrid approach. And it's kind of cool to see that uh, you know research uh, exists across this pretty much this entire plane. Um, but there are also some kind of gaps which are interesting. Like a lot of work has been focused on the loss function for forward simulation, uh, maybe less so uh, for equation, like uh, doing equation discovery with uh, architect different architectures, for example. Um, and so you kind of see this is reflected by all these different kind of scientific machine learning techniques that are out there today, like Fourier neural operators, neural ordering differential equations, physics and formal neural networks. Um, so yeah, there's a plethora of, of techniques. Another way you can kind of slice and dice these, these methods is uh, how close they are to kind of traditional workflows and how close they are to like naive machine learning. And so what, what does that mean? So naive machine learning, I would describe as just having a, a training data set and no understanding of the science behind it and just getting the network to like predict inputs and outputs of that data set. On the other hand, you would have no machine learning at all, and you just have a traditional like finite difference solver or, or inverse algorithm, for example. So you can start to uh, put these techniques on this spectrum, and it's kind of hard to define exactly where they lie. But so, for example, if you're just uh, uh, encoding stuff in your loss function, it's pretty much just a neural network with like a with a better loss. So maybe more towards the left hand side. But if you're doing uh, neural ordinary differential equations with a traditional finite difference solver, then maybe it's more to the right. So, uh, so uh, another way to think of this is like some techniques have hard constraints of your physics. Uh, so, what, you know, where the physics is always obeyed and, and some of them uh, are like softer constraints where the physics can be violated if it makes sense from the, from the training data. And so I think the, the takeaway here is uh, these are all key uh, um, decisions that you need to make, you need to make when you're using deep learning for a deep, uh, scientific task. And it's often not clear like how, sh how strong a constraint you want to uh, apply when you're doing machine learning for science. So uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna cover the, at least the, the circled ones uh, in, this, in this course. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're actually finishing pretty, pretty early, but I think this is fine. Um, I wanna give you a, a, a summary of the lecture. So I started off by saying deep learning has grown exponentially in the last decade and has had massive advancements and has really changed our daily lives. And it's really showing potential for revolution, revolutionizing science. And what I've really tried to motivate is this new field which combines scientific principles with machine learning to create more powerful, uh, generalizable and robust methods. And there's a whole plethora of techniques out there. And so in this course, we're really gonna try and get you understanding that forefront of the research and some of these techniques. So yeah, thank you for listening and uh, see you next week. Mm -hmm.